U.S. District Court Judge Thomas Rose uh, in the United States District Court of Southern, uh, Southern District of Ohio in re-foreclosure cases, and then there's like 17 cases here or something like that. Opinion and order. And then we're going to go down to here where we're going to read it. And this is what the judge is saying. To satisfy Article Three standing requirements, see I make a big deal about standing, a plaintiff must show it has suffered an injury in fact or that is concrete and particularized and actual or imminent, not conjectural or, and then that was from a court case, and that to show standing then in a foreclosure action, the plaintiff, that would be the bank generally, must show that it is the holder of the note and the mortgage, that's the deed of trust, at the time the complaint was filed. So if they can't show the original wet ink a deed of trust and a note together, then they don't have a right. They have no right. The foreclosure plaintiff must also show at the time the foreclosure action is filed that the holder of the note and the mortgage is harmed. In other words, not just that I have both of them, but that even though I have both of them, how was I harmed, right? I mean, if you didn't loan any, if you just created the money from thin air, then how could you be harmed, right? Usually by not having been received payments on the note, you know, so they're not going to go quite as far as there's no money, right, like I do. But the point is, is that almost all these banks are operating in fraud and they can't produce the um, note and deed of trust even. So here's a, another court case in the United States District Court in Northern District of Ohio, Eastern Division. Okay. This is Christopher A. Boyko, and this was done in 2007. This court issued an order requiring the plaintiff lenders in a number of pending foreclosure cases to file a copy of the executed assignment demonstrating that the plaintiff was the holder and owner of the note and mortgage. That's the deed of trust. Note and deed of trust as of the date the complaint was filed or the court would enter a dismissal. The court dismisses the ca captioned cases without prejudice. In other words, they didn't prove that they had them, right? Further, the plaintiff bears the burden of demonstrating standing, there we go again, and must plead its components with specificity, okay? The minimum con constitutional requirements for standing are proof of injury, in fact, causation, and redressability. And then we go down to requirements of Article 3 of the United States Constitution. The plaintiff must show he has personally suffered some actual injury as a result of the illegal conduct of the defendant. The plaintiff alleges it is the holder and owner of the note and mortgage. Who's the, def who's the plaintiff? Now, almost every time in a foreclosure case, it's the beneficiary who's doing the suing, not the lender, not the person who allegedly lent you the money who has the right to do that. It's MERS, the beneficiary. However, the attached note and Mortgage identify the mortgagee and promisee as the original lending institution, like Bank of America made the loan, right? Not BO Bank of America servicers. You know, they're not the lender. Okay, so once again, the affidavits submitted in, the, in these cases recite the averment, that's the claim, that the plaintiff is the owner of the note and mortgage without any mention of an assignment or trust or successor interest. Once again, the, the beneficiary is not the lender. So unless the lender assigned the beneficiary the note and mortgage, which they don't do, then they wouldn't be the possessor or the holder in due course. Consequently, you know, the courts requested that each plaintiff submit a copy of the assignment of the note and mortgage executed as of the date of the foreclosure complaint. In the above captioned cases, none, right, none of the assignments show the named plaintiff, MERS, to be the owner 
of the rights and title and interest under the mortgage at issue as of the date of the foreclosure complaint. So they basically came in there and lied. These proffered documents belie the plaintiff's assertion that they own the note and mortgage by means of a purchase which predated the complaint by days, months, or years. The court considered the principles of real party and interest. So in other words, only the person who actually has the right and to claim the injury can be the, suit, the party that's suing. So when the beneficiary sues without being able to claim that they have a right to sue, they're not the real party of interest. And then he, uh, then he rebuked the counsel. Astoundingly, counsel at oral argument stated that his client, the purchaser from the original mortgagee, that would be the lender, acquired complete legal and equitable interest in land when money changed hands, even before the purchase agreement, let alone a proper assignment made its way into its client's possession. So there we go. There's a couple of court cases. And, you know, a couple years ago when I started this, there was very few court cases you could rely on that would show um, that the banks were committing fraud. Nowadays, if you looked up on the Internet, if you couldn't find 100 court cases, I'd be shocked. Now I'm going to show you um, an example of a stamp that I use to cancel the mortgage. I ordered this stamp made up, and it says, Canceled for cause of breach. Commercial code in California, 2711, 21064. One, failure to fully disclose, produce documents, and comply with laws. Two, fraudulent inducement to part with value. What was the inducement? Hey, they advertised we have money to loan when they didn't actually loan you any money. And the value that you parted with was your labor, right, in making payments and the signature on the promissory note, which they say, you know, they, didn't, they, they never told you it was valuable, and yet, obviously, it's worth as much money as you wrote on there. Three, failure to identify the source of the funds and the true lender, because in reality, it was you who was the true lender. Four, default on showing the facts supporting proof of claim. And then executed on, and then without recourse, by grantor nunk pro tunk. Back to the beginning. Stamp that I use, and then I just get the certified copy of the deed of trust and, and cancel it after they default on the letters, the debt validation letters and the QWR, which QWR takes 60 days, but you get a default on the debt validation letters in, a, in basically a month. Okay, and the next thing you'll have to deal with is the repeated letters from the banks. You know, well, let's go back to the deed of trust. And you know, you're going to have a stamp made up, uh, and you're going to put it on each pa page of the certified copy of the deed of trust. And you're going to want to get the loan application documents, which the banks generally have no problem with sending you. Thank you very much. And you're going to cancel those also because the, your application for a loan and the deed of trust are what bind you. So you're going to get your stamp made up and um, you're going to stamp each page of the loan uh, application that the bank sends you as copies and the certified copy of the deed of trust. Under the law, you can cancel any contract for fraud. And since the bank has not proven its claim, it lends you money, then the deed uh, contract, then deed of trust was fraudulent. If you don't make a claim, you cannot get any rights, so you must put on paper and give common law notice and grace, or in other words, constructive notice and grace, and time to respond or lose the right to respond. Here's a typical deed of trust, and you go to the county recorder's office and get a certified copy of this, identifying the borrower. The borrower is the person above that there's named. And then the trustee is Greenhead Investments. And the beneficiary is Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems. Okay, MERS. You would take this deed of trust and take your stamp and just put your stamp across it. Now the stamp is going to cancel it. So you're saying I'm canceling for cause of breach. 
and you're going to get your blue pen, not a black pen, and sign your name. And then you're going to tell what day, you know, you executed on the 20th day of June 2011. And there you go. And you're going to do this on each single page you get from the county recorder's office that's certified. And don't remove the staple, because if you remove the staple and separate the pages, then they could make a claim that the certification's void. There's the second page, right? I'm just going to go down at the bottom here. Some place where I have, you know, some white showing. And do the same down here. Right, and just sign each page. Stamp each page and sign each page. Next thing you'll have to deal with is repeated letters from the banks. I mean, they don't send them all the time, but when you send them a letter, usually they'll respond with some uh, paperwork showing you that here's the copy of the promissory note, here's a copy of the deed of trust. Look, see, you promised to send us a payment every month. It's not, look, see, we loaned you money. It's, look, see, you signed an agreement to send us uh, you know, $2,000 every month, and you didn't do it. You signed an agreement. Uh, and your position is, look, see, I didn't realize that you didn't loan me any money, and if, if I had known that you weren't loaning me any money, I wouldn't have done the deal. You know, you committed fraud. So, they're going to send you letters, that a cover letter, generally, that goes along with uh, copies of the statements, you know, from day one when you started making payments, how many payments you made, you know, maybe you made... Uh, six years worth of payments, that'd be 72 payments. So they send, send you a little accounting slip. You know, it's like the credit card companies, when they sue you, they send you a copy of the, some of the um, statements that you've had. Never all of them, but you know, they'll send you a stack of copies of statements. Like that's supposed to prove that they loaned you money. You know, it doesn't prove that they lent you money. It proves that there are statements, that there were transactions, but that doesn't show where the money originated from was your application. So anyway, <clears throat> the only document important to respond to will be the cover letter, right? I mean, just the first sheet, and in it you'll find statements like, quote, you have an obligation to honor your contract with us. Now here is a typical answer from Bank of America, Home Loans, Customer Service Department, and that it notes the party it's being addressed to and it's in regarding to the property address and the loan number dear so-and-so thank you for contacting our office with your letter, letter dated February 9th 2011 addressed to BAC home loan servicing LP regarding the above referenced loan Bank of America has carefully reviewed the information you provided and has determined that your inquiry does not appear to be specifically related to a servicing concern related to your loan. Now, why why do you think that would be? I mean, if the loan is invalid, I would say the servicing is invalid. But and I'm going to let BAC make a determination, right? Because do they have any authority to make a determination like that? No. Your loan remains in full force and effect. Well, that sounds like a legal determination to me. You're making a claim there. My claim is that I don't have a loan with you, and your claim is that your loan remains in full force and effect. But let's look down here, and we see sincerely nobody, right? This is always the way I get letters. Sincerely Nobody. Customer service. Now, who's the party that signed it? Who's the party that's going to take full commercial liability for their statement? Who's the party that doesn't want to be sued for making false claims? You know, this is how much they want to stand up for what they believe in. They're scared to death of you. Or, there is no legal requirement that we provide the information you request. That's my favorite. 
And I just write back, there's no legal excuse for not uh, f fulfilling my demand either. I take these statements and conditionally accept them based upon proof of claim. I conditionally accept that you don't have to show me any of the documents based on proof of claim. I mean, can you show me the law that, ex that says you don't have to honor the Constitution and that you don't have to show me the documents that substantiate your, uh, that you have a debt, that I have a debt to you? They refuse to show proof of claim and such, such as an affidavit by someone with first-hand knowledge of the alleged, quote, loan. They refuse to show copies and make originals available for viewing at court of the, of, the, of the wedding signed documents. Why? You know, what's so hard for them to do? Why is that a big deal? Why is it such a big deal that they got to get robo-signers to fraudulently sign documents? If you loaned Bob $1,000 for your labor exchange for Federal Reserve notes and Bob asked to have a copy of the original documents and to witness the original and you refused, he would have a legitimate reason to believe that you lost it and could not produce it and that he would be free of his obligation to you. Now, of course, a private party might lose it, but can a bank actually claim they lost it? I mean, that would be not very good uh, bookkeeping on their part. How about if they sold it to Wall Street investors, right? If you sold Bob's debt to another party, then the other party would be the one to collect on it, and it would be fraud for you to claim that you were owed a debt. So when Wall Street investors buy up into a into a fund that pays a you know a percent you know let's say the fund pays five percent on their money or something like that, right? Then they're the ones that are the true owners of the debt because they purchased uh, shares of that pool, and yet they're never given any of the documentation showing uh, what the collateral is that they're getting. You know, it's just a big Ponzi scheme. If you're going to fight with the bank, you're going to have to learn to be a scholar of the law and follow procedures that gather admissible evidence. Every document you send is going to have is going to be sent by a proof of service. So let's just show you what a proof of service looks like. So here in the top, you're going to fill out the documents served, and you can, you could you know type them in you know, on the computer, or you can fill them in by hand. And you want to identify the document so there's no excuse when you look at it that you're, you're not talking about the same document. And a good way to do that is by title and date. So you go, you know, the title of the document is Notice of Final Default Slash Default. And the date is, you know, March 17th, 2010. Now, if somebody wants to talk about which letter it was, then, you know, if you wanted to identify it further, you could say sent certified mail number, blah, 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 blah. And that's pretty much, you know, classic identification, airtight. Then you got the service date, the month, the day, and then you go, I am over the age of 18 years old and not a party to the action, and I enclosed the above named documents in an envelope and mailed them with the United States Postal Service with the postage fully paid prepaid. Registered and certified mail number is, and then you just put in the registered and certified mail number. And then you have the addressee, that's the person who you're sending it to, and mailed from would be the person doing the proof of service. And then you say, you know, I declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct and executed on what date are you doing this and without prejudice by such and such. Here's an example just, you know, so you can see what it would look like, you know. Up here, you, have, you can put the case number in court or the, the number of the loan, you know, the, the Bank of America loan number, MIN number, blah, blah, blah. Proof of service by mail. Here we have notice of default dated January 6th, 08. Declaration of John Doe dated September 24th, 08. Affidavit of John Doe dated. So these are the documents that you're going to be sending off, and then you put the dates in. And then you're going to put, you know, certified mail number and then write it in there so you know what the certified mail number is for this proof of service because you're sending this out at, you know, with certified mail. And if you want airtight, you know, evidence and, you know, if it's really important, then you're going to want to get green signature cards and you're going to attach a green signature card to the letter 
and it's going to have its return, um, it's like a postcard with a return address on it. And when they accept it, they sign the green signature card and the green signature card gets mailed back to you. And that's your proof that a, you know, living soul actually accepted the service. Acceptance of service is everything. So you're going to take your uh, QWR, Qualified Written Request, and your Conditional Acceptance of Debt. And, you know, this is just an example, but you'd go to the last page and you'd sign it. You always sign things in blue ink. You never sign it in black. I signed this one in black just so you'd have an idea of what it would look like after you made the photocopy, right? And then I take a stamp here and I put it up here somewhere and I say that I'm making this like an original by putting the stamp, this um, certification here. So I certify it and I say the date is uh, 5 20 2011. And I can certify any uh, document that I have in my possession that I've made. I mean, even if it's notarized, I can certify that it's, that it's a copy of the original. I can't certify a birth certificate or a marriage license or something like that that's available from the county recorder as a certified copy but I can certify copies of my own stuff. So this way you have, you keep the wet ink original and you send the certified copy to them. And then you take, you know, your proof of service. You do a proof of service by a third party, the notary hopefully. And if you can't find a notary, then a friend was going to do the proof of service. And any response is going to be mailed back to them. And you would take your, your letters and Fold them up. And then put them in your envelope. And here you have your envelope is going to, you know, the return address is going to be Jane Doe, Sui Juris, your notary care of the P.O. box. Or it's the third party. Right? And in the right corner, you're going to put stamps. Don't ever let the post office put uh, that sticker with money on it. That's not a stamp. Only stamps issued by the post office are stamps. And have authority as a, a delivery of mail. Then I put the certified sticker on here, and I leave the tail on here instead of tearing it off until I get down to the post office so things don't get lost. And then on the back side, you can put whatever it's you know, QWR, or just put a little note to yourself of, you know, what, what it is that you're sending, right? And then you have it uh, addressed to private and confidential to Charles Noski, who's the CFO of Bank of America, care of Bank of America Corporate Center, 100 North Tryon Street, Charlotte, North Carolina, and then the zip code in a box. Now you're going to take your your letters and put them inside the envelope seal it up and now that it's sealed you're going to take your green signature card and put it on the back side here and there you go it's mailed to Charles Noski and your you put the uh, certified mail number down at the bottom and then when you get it back they're supposed to stamp it so well they are supposed to sign for it but usually they don't sign for it they just stamp things and go down to the post office and mail it off then you'll get the green signature card which is kind of like a postcard mailed back to the party who sent it, the third party that's a uh, witness organization. One of the most important things you're going to have to do is get organized. So you're going to need file folders. And you need to keep all of your records straight. When you get green cards back, they go in the file folder. They get clipped to the proof of service. They get... Um, Well, you're going to send letters off, right? And then you're going to get everything back. 
and in order to keep things organized because you're going to get lots of these what I do is I put the um, certified mail and then the green card and then the letter the original letter the wet ink letter that I'm keeping and the wet ink uh, proof of service and I put them all together and just put a um, paper clip over the top and then that group of things is all together and then the next time I send a letter that's different then I do it with that letter that set so that I can go through them and find out which ones that I've done now if you want to see how you can find out the names of the parties you're going to send stuff to you know here's contact capital one CEO home verified um, and we have Richard Fairbank and his wife is Christine Fairbank and he's at 1403 Langley Place McLean Virginia Peter Shaw and it says he is the risk officer and is responsible for overseeing Capital One's credit so I got this off of um, contact Capital One for free Richard Fairbank HTP contact the CEO dot com contact Capital One so that you can just look up all these different companies and they'll have um, the contact information for them in addition I like to verify that it's current by looking up their name on a, on a Google search or whatever and um, you know it may be that they were appointed uh, CEO or Chief Financial Officer CFO in uh, 2006 but then they were replaced in 2010 or 2011 so let's assume that you've done the defaults on the QWR and the notice of debt validation letters and have canceled the deed of trust and sent copies to all the parties all the parties the parties are the original lender the original beneficiary and the original trustee okay now sometimes in this in this day and age Chicago title which has been around for a hundred years it seems to me went out of business gee not a good sign <laughs> So there, you know, I've had trouble finding, you know, the players in some of these little games where, you know, maybe the lender um, stepped in and was making a bunch of loans and they just disappear. I mean, they fold up shop, they took all their money, and you can't find them. So let's assume that you've done the defaults and you're, you've sent the parties all of your stuff. The next thing to do would be a Freedom of Information Act request. You're going to send a Freedom of Information Act request or a FOIA to the IRS to get a copy of the proof that the bank already got paid on a 1099 OID and 1099A. The bank created the funds from your promissory note and got the money from the U.S. Treasury and noted it on a 10 IRS 1099 OID or original issue discount. Three years later, when you didn't collect the money that was sitting there waiting for you at the bank, the bank applied to the IRS to keep the money you abandoned and filed a 1099-A for abandonment and acquisition. You abandon it and they are acquiring it. So the fact that you didn't know that you had uh, $350,000 on the bank loan sitting in the bank, I guess that would be because they never actually gave you the deposit slip for your promissory note letting you know that there was $350,000 in the account, right? So you're going to get the 1099 OID and 1099A, which is going to show that the bank got paid. They got the money. And um, yeah, if the IRS sends you the 1099 OID and 1099A showing your original lender on the date you got the original loan filed the IRS forms, you have proof that they got paid and are falsely claiming that you owe them money. Actually, what they are doing is deceiving you into voluntarily admitting you promised to send them payments every month even though you didn't owe them any money. You believed you did owe them money because they did not inform you that the promissory note had any value. And, you know, another common thing is a lot of people have to don't have 20% down, so they get mortgage insurance. Well, the mortgage insurance pays the bank the whole amount. So when you don't, when you get foreclosed on, the bank collects the whole amount. I mean, if you have a $350,000 loan, the insurance pays $350,000 to the bank. How about you getting some? I mean, you've been paying the insurance. Why should you pay insurance so that the bank can collect money? 
When you pay insurance, it's to insure yourself, not the bank. <laughs> if you didn't have any value, why did you need to sign for it? The promissory note. Did they have, don't they have a deed of trust already signed stating that if you didn't pay them 360 payments of $2,000 each month, they could take the home? That's the, you know, that's the enforcement, the security agreement that they, that they securitized and recorded at the recorder's office. They don't record the promissory note, and there's a reason for that. They don't want anybody knowing that, that they got paid, right? So that, but there's no necessity of having a promissory note and a deed of trust. The deed of trust is the contract that says they're going to get to keep the house if you don't make the payments. So if you give me a piece of paper promising to pay me $400,000 and it has all the elements of a check on it, the name of the party promising to pay, that'd be you, the name of the party to be paid, that'd be me, the date, the amount that it... That, and, and an amount, then it is valuable. However, the bank did not give you a receipt showing you deposited $400,000 into their account, did they? The next thing you can do is a securitization report. For about $1,500, you can order a securitization report which will identify who the bank sold your note to on Wall Street. They put it in a pool, and they'll track, track which pool got it and what the, um, the contract of the pool is. Okay, here's an example of what happens in the securitization and the process of the loan. This is a flow chart that's available on the web for you to look at. And anyway, it's Dan and Terry securities transaction. All right. So they come in and they make a loan application. And then that loan application gets, you know, they get an appraisal. Then they go in and the loan package gets presented to the mortgage lenders, which are, they're going to call themselves the lender. And then from there, it goes up to the amount financed gets given to the, um, to the uh, first national title company. And the title company cashes out the loan, and gives the seller the loan, they have an escrow account. And the deed of trust and promissory note goes to the title company. And then the deed is issued to MERS as nominee for the lender, and they're the beneficiary, right? But they, they, they aren't assigned the debt, so they're only the nominee, which means they're the named party. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have the right to any of the debt. Then the note is issued to MLN and split from the deed. Uh-oh, once the note is split from the deed, you don't have any authority to foreclose anymore. So you can see that there's just a ton of information on here to study as to what happens, but it's very interesting. And almost all the time, the pooling and servicing agreements are violated by the bank. That makes a foreclosure an impossibility as the note and the deed of trust parted ways and unless they are held together the, all the time. I mean, they can never be separated. So there has to be a, a custodian of records that swears that the deed of trust, the wedding deed of trust and the wedding promissory note never left the vault and have stayed and lived together forever in a folder. And unless they're to, the alleged, together, the alleged lender cannot enforce them and foreclose, as you read in those uh, court cases. I mean, they have to be in possession of both. But what they didn't say is they have to be in possession of both all the time. And then they have to be the holder in due course. In other words, they can't have sold it to a pool, to a group of investors on Wall Street, and still claim it's theirs, even if... You know, which is what they do. They don't actually give them to the investors on Wall Street when they have mortgage-backed securities. This is one more tool to get hard evidence of deceit and unlawful behavior on the part of the bank. And then, notice of preservation of interest. Now you can file a notice of preservation of interest at the county recorder's office declaring that you are preserving your interest as the sole owner of your home. And the debt validation letters, the defaults, the deed canceled, will be evidence of your interest in the home. Once the recorder has filed it, you will have a claim that can't be denied as anyone looking up your assets in the county will come across that file. And here's an example of a notice of 
intent to preserve interest that I actually filed with the county recorder about a year and a half ago in a case with a friend on an unlawful detainer. And you can see it's um, the correct wording is something to the effect. This notice is an in, is an interest in real property and the common in the common law and pursuant to civil code 880.320 of at sec of the of the civil code of California. That has to be on there, otherwise they won't record it. Claimant is so and so address, and the interest is I Jane Doe claim the sole right to possess legal and equitable title to the to the named real property as the only one who has any lawful assets paid in consideration to acquire said property. Indy Mac Bank defaulted on the opportunity to establish proof of claim, repossessory rights, recorded at nationalpublicregistry.com as 2008-1608, blah, blah, blah. So they can go look it up if they want to see the actual papers that we filed. I am in possession of said property, possession's nine-tenths of the law, and I don't believe any party can support a claim to the contrary with factual proof. U.S. Bank National Association defaulted on rebutting my rightful claim to the property in the court case in open court. The property is described as follows. The real property address, blah, blah, blah. And then it, you get it notarized. Take it down to the county recorder's office and they'll file stamp it and give you a you can then think about clouding the title the way the banks do by putting the house into an irrevocable trust so that you don't own it anymore and it will go to your heirs or favorite charity. I mean, guess what? If you're going to lose the home in a foreclosure anyway, you might as well go through transferring it into an irrevocable trust. Now, I don't own it anymore. You can't take it from me. And if you want to take it, you're going to have to go to court. What the banks don't want to do? The banks don't want to go to court because in court they have to use factual evidence to prove their case. So if they go to court, they're going to have to actually put evidence into the record. So if you quit claim your home into a trust that you make up and become the trustee who will maintain the trust property and buy and sell trust property, you can do everything you do now as the owner, except that it's not yours anymore. It really belongs to your children. But that's okay with you because you're going to give it to your children anyway, aren't you? So now you have the, um, you know, the rubber duck trust who owns the house recorded, you know, at the county recorder's office after you record your preservation of interest. You go, it's my house since I own it outright, and I am quit claiming it into this trust. Now the trust owns it. Now the bank's going to have to go after the trust, and they can't go after you anymore. When the bank wants to cloud the title, what, what they do typically, that when they go into a foreclosure, is the first thing they do is substitute the trustee, and then the trustee uh, sets a sale date for a trustee sale of the house. And then they sell it to some dummy corporation, probably an, a subsidiary of the bank, who comes in at a closed sale and buys it, and there's no actual proof that, they, that any money transferred hand and they go record it down at the county recorder's offices that I, I paid $350,000. Oh yeah, prove it. You know, there's no evidence whatsoever. It's an agreement between them and the bank that, that did the unlawful foreclosure. <laughs> and by the way, Kamala Harris, the Attorney General of California, is currently looking into fraudulent foreclosure activities back to 2007. Well, let's look at this, some court cases. Deutsche Bank National Trust Company, and this is a case you can see this was actually filed, right? This, this is a copy, of course, but this, this is an actual court case in the Court of Common Pleas, Claremont County, Ohio. The defendant's matter came before the court for a bench trial and a case ordered dismissed for lack of subject matter jurisdiction findings of fact. And we go down to the defendant, Stephen M. Feck, applied for a loan, right, to finance this house. The defendant voluntarily executed an adjustable rate promissory note, 
the mortgage securing payment of the note, the mortgage was recorded in the county recorder's office. Defendant Steve Pe uh, Feck ceased making payments on the note. Well, this is a pretty common story. Steve Feck is not currently making payments on the note. The defendants reside at the property. I mean, he's still living in it. Defendants receive mail at the property. That's important because receiving mail establishes that you're, you know, living there. And the t and the plaintiff, which was the bank, proceeded with presenting testimony uh, of Christopher Spradling. Spradling is a representative of Litton Loan Servicing. Litton acted as servicer for the GSAMP Trust. Now, what do we know about that? Well, that's the. It's, uh, uh, Pool. Pool. That's the pool. Right. <clears throat> and the securitized trust under which the plaintiff served as trustee and into which the mortgage loan at issue was allegedly placed in November 1st, 2005. Spradling testified that Litton, that's the servicer for the pool, in its role as servicer was not responsible for keeping the original loan file presumably containing the original subject note. Now, what do we know about that? If you don't have the note and the deed together, and you can swear that it never, they never were separated, then you have no right to foreclose. Plaintiff produced the original note at and mortgage at trial. So somehow they dug up the original. By way of an allonge on the original note, the note was at some point transferred from South Star Funding, who would be what? The originator. The originator who probably is on the deed of trust as the, uh, the lender. lender. By blank endorsement. What's that? Well, they, this is a norm, they, they, they do this normally when, when they transfer, they sell the note along the securitization process, they endorse it in blank to be filled out just before foreclosure. And the endorsement is pay to the order and then it's just then blank, blank so you could so, fill in the na so any name you wanted. It becomes a bearer, bearer type bond. In instrument. Now, is it illegal to change that, a, a promissory note? Yeah, you can't add words to it. The promissory note is I promise to pay and I sign my name to it and stuff like that. The bank can't come along later and change it the minute you put pay to the order of, it becomes a negotiable instrument, instrument. and right. it has value. And what's its value? If it's a $500,000 note, it's worth 500000 the minute you right. put pay to the order on it. Right. So they would have to credit you 500000 because it's your instrument. Right. And this is the real problem. The mortgage was assigned to the plaintiff by an instrument dated April 21st, 2008, and recorded at the... Claremont County Recorder's Office. Defendants proffered no evidence at trial. Conclusions of law. One, when an instrument is endorsed in blank, it becomes payable to the bearer and may be negotiated by transfer of possession alone. In other words, if you find somebody's check that they dropped out of their pocket and it says pay to cash, you have authority yeah, to cash it. Right. They don't even have, can't even ask you your name. Uh, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 17A requires that all actions be prosecuted in the name of the real party in interest. The real party in interest is the party who has been wronged, who has a, a, a suffered a loss or personal injury. Three, where a party lacks a real interest in the subject matter of the action, it lacks standing to invoke the court's jurisdiction. And then they provide the cases there. Four, the holder of rights or interest in property is a necessary part to a foreclosure action. In other words, you, you have to be the one with the right to foreclose. Otherwise, you can't um, proceed with a foreclosure action. Five, where a plaintiff in a foreclosure action is not the real party of interest in the as of the filing of its complaint, dismissal of the complaint without prejudice as to its refiling is the appropriate remedy. In other words, you have the opportunity to bring it back if you can show that you have, uh, you know, that you have standing to sue. We're not saying you can't come back and bring the charge again with the correct information. But if you don't have the correct information, you can't bring it 
So they're dismissing it without prejudice, which means they can bring it back. If he dismissed it with prejudice, you'd never be able to bring it back. Six, in light of the notes transfer from South Star by undated blank endorsement and the testimony of a witness, witness without direct personal knowledge as to the timing of the notes. So anyway, they dismissed, in this case, they dismissed it and uh, kicked it out. And this was against, you know, Deutsche Bank National. So then we go to the next case that's interesting is a United States Bankruptcy Court case. This was actually filed in 2008. And um, MERS is suing for relief of stay motion. So they move the court to remove the house from bankruptcy, right? So that they can go ahead and have a trustee sale. What happens in a bankruptcy proceeding, a bankruptcy will stop a trustee sale. So if your house is set up for a trustee sale, you can file bankruptcy for about $300 and stop the sale from happening. And while you're at it, you can challenge the bank on its authority to foreclose at all because the whole purpose of bankruptcy court is to find out who owes what to who. So if you say that I don't believe I owe any money to the bank, then the bankruptcy court has an authority to investigate to find out whether that's true or not, like any other court. And what they usually do is, if you go in there and say, I have a loan and I owe the bank uh, $800,000, and the bank, the, the judge will turn to you and say, I don't see how you can challenge the, uh, any debt you have to the bank. You're the one that filed the, the application that says you owe the bank $800,000. So my advice would be, if you're going to send a, a statement into the bankruptcy court, you can call the bank a creditor and the amount due owed to them is unknown, right? Because you don't know what the actual amount, if any, that you owe to them would be. So let's just read a few of the things that this guy said in this case. Well, let's go back up and see. The, the judge was definitely on this guy's side. And, you know, I would believe that he would be on his side because we take a look at him. And the debtor is an 83-year-old retired World War II veteran whose monthly income is next to nothing, right? And that so what the debtor is claiming is, is that the bank uh, committed fraud by, by uh, falsely um, signing his name to a loan application and creating two loans. So let's read. The other which underlies this motion for relief from the automatic stay was reportedly made with Freedom Home Mortgage, FHM, on October 3rd for $630,000. In addition, there's another October 3rd loan for $150,000 also with Freedom Home, uh, Freedom Home Mortgage. Debtor asserts that none of these documents bears his signature and that each signature is invalid and forged. So he's accusing them of forging his name. He's 83 years old. If they forged his name to take advantage of him, that would be a travesty. So here he says, MERS is a beneficiary under the deed of trust acting solely as a nominee for lender and lender's successor and assigns. And we'll get into why that's important. The motion is a declaration. The motion includes a declaration by Robert Turner, an employee of Countrywide Home Loans Incorporated, Countrywide, which is a duly authorized servicing agent of the movement. The movement is the plaintiff, is the party that's suing or putting the motion in. The de declaration states that Turner is a custodian of the books, records, and files of the movement, and that he knows these documents were prepared in the ordinary course of business of movement, of movement, and that he has a business duty to record accurately the events documented in these records. However, neither the declaration nor the testimony at trial gives any hint as to how Turner has custody of any books, records, or files. Okay. Turner appeared and testified on September 30th, 2008. From his testimony, the court finds that he is a low-level clerk for Countrywide, responsible for some 500 loan defaults per week. Wow. Business must be good. Analysis. The motion for relief of stay must be denied on two separate grounds. First, 
it purports to include unidentified moving parties who are intended to benefit from the relief of stay order. What's the benefit? We're going to take the house out of foreclosure protection, which lasts, uh, I mean, bankruptcy protection, which lasts for one year, and we're going to allow them to sell it. Secondly, Turner is altogether incompetent to give any testimony relevant to this motion. So he ha the judge has to know who the real party of interest is, who's the one who's the lender, who's the one who has the right to sue, because he would be required to recuse himself. Let's say he had a loan with Countrywide, and Countrywide's the movement. Well, then he would have a conflict of interest, and he'd have to recuse himself, right? So he says he has to know who the real party is. A secured promissory note traded on the secondary mar mortgage market remains secured because the mortgage follows the note. California Civil Code uh, 2936, the assignment of a debt secured by mortgage carries with it the security. California codified this principle in 1872. Similarly, this is a mortgage bankruptcy in California, so he's citing California law. Similarly, this has long been the law throughout the United States. When a note secured by a mortgage is transferred, quote, transfer of the note carries with it the security without any formal assignment or delivery or even mention of the latter. What's the security? The deed of trust. Okay. The debt is the principal thing and the mortgage is accessory. While the note is essential, the mortgage is only an incident to the note. The note is the promise to pay the money, right? The truth may be ascertained and the proceedings justly determined. That's the sole purpose of court, to find the truth. Turner made no attempt whatsoever to assure the accuracy of his declaration. The general rule is that a witness may only testify as to matters within the personal knowledge of the witness. Quote, a witness may not testify to a matter unless evidence is introduced sufficient to support a finding that the witness has personal knowledge of the matter. If you don't have personal knowledge of it, it's what? Hearsay. Hearsay evidence. You can't testify to, to knowledge that's not your personal knowledge. In his declaration, Turner presented the numbers in paragraph 6 and 8 for, for their truth. This evidence was hearsay and is not admissible unless an exception to the hearsay rule is applicable. The declaration is in a real party property relief from a stay motion is required to state in paragraph 6 the amount of movement's claim with respect to the property, including the principal owing on the loan, the amount of the accrued interest, the amount of the charges, any evident advances such as property taxes or insurance, and the total amount of the, ch of the claim. The declarant must further attach a true and correct copy of the promissory note and the deed of trust, and the declarant must be competent to testify as to the authenticity of these documents. Well, I'm going to say you have to pr uh, provide the real not a cop cert certified copy, but the real wet ink signed instruments, otherwise you don't have any authority. I mean, try taking a copy, a photocopy of a check down to the bank and see if they'll cash it. And just use whatever reason they give you as a reason why you won't accept <laughs> anything less than the wet ink signed originals. FHM apparently relies on Rule 8036 for admissibility of the hearsay evidence. That's Federal Rules of Evidence, excuse me rules of evidence on the federal level. And bankruptcy courts are all federal courts, by the way, so they would have to follow federal rules But for the admissibility of hearsay evidence. The basic elements for the introduction of business records under the hearsay exception for records of regularly conducted activity all apply to records maintained electronically. So you should have the original wet ink signed promissory note, and that's not an electronically uh, maintained record. Such records must be, one, made at or near the 
the time by or from information transmitted by a person with knowledge. Two, made pursuant to a regular practice of the business activity. Three, kept in the course of regularly conducted business activity. And four, the source, method, or circumstances of the preparation must not indicate lack of trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. Like you'd have to have everything under lock and key and you're the only one with the key. No other keys exist then you might be able to make the claim that you know, you've had it in your possession. The admission of computer records requires that the movement provide an 11th step foundation. The business uses a computer. The computer is reliable. The business has developed a procedure for inserting data into the computer. Do you have a procedure? The procedure has built in safeguards to ensure accuracy and identify errors. Like you, know, you have a pass password and how many people have passwords to this computer? 300? Oh my god, I think there might be a leak possible. The business keeps the computer in a good state of repair. The witness has, has the, had the computer read out of the data, the witness, and blah, blah, blah. But you, know, you can see where you could easily um, throw them for not keeping a complete um, Trustworthy right trustworthiness. Right. Yes. <clears throat> Under the Ninth Circuit, the law of the fourth requirement presumes details regarding the computer policy consisting of A, computer control procedures including control of access to the database. How many people had access to the database? I mean, if more than one did, then it's possible that, uh, you know, things were switched. A party offering an item of non-testimony evidence such as a document not offered to prove the truth of its constants must prove that the item is what the party claims it is. Accordingly, authentication is a condition of the admissibility of such evidence. There are two issues that MERS must address with respect to the promissory note. First, it must authenticate the note. Second, it must show that it is entitled to enforce the note. A promissory note document itself is not a business record, as that term may be used in the law of hearsay, but rather it is an operative contractual document admissible merely upon adequate evidence of authenticity. So if you have the original wet ink signed one, then I guess that's authentic. Anything less than that wouldn't be. Turner gave no testimony as to the authenticity of the note here at issue. And, indeed, the debtor vigorously contests the authenticity of the note in this case. Failure to object is to agree, so you better make your objection that it's not the right one. So if they, even if they brought in a certified copy, you have to object and say, that's not the, that's not the promissory note I signed. How could it be? It's a copy. Only the holder of a negotiable promissory note with minor exceptions, not relevant to this case, is entitled to enforce the note. Holder of the negotiable promissory note. What's negotiable mean? If That's you can negotiate the paper, it has value, right? I mean, you can't negotiate something. That's what a, a banking term. You can't negotiate a piece of paper that has no value. You can't... Uh, extend it out for credit or for payment for money. So when they put, when they endorsed it, pay to the order of, and they deposited, suddenly now your promissory note for $350,000 is worth what? So the person making a demand shows its right to enforce by showing the original of the promissory note. Murris has not brought to court the note here at issue and makes no pretense that it holds the note. Indeed, Murris is not in the business of holding promissory notes. There is no evidence before the court as to who is the holder of the promissory note, which would, you know, ostensibly be the original lender and nobody else, and is entitled to enforce it. Under California law, only the holder of a note is entitled to enforce it with minor exceptions not relevant here in C. California Commercial Code 3301. Okay, here's Chapter 3, Enforcement of Instruments, Commercial Code 3301. The Commercial Code of California is really the UCC. However, it's not good to use UCC 
because whatever state you're in has a codification of the commercial code, in other words the legislature adopted it, and they have their own numbers which are very closely related to UCC numbers. You have to use your state's codification of the, or the UCC. Anyway, California Commercial Code 3301, quote, person entitled to enforce an instrument means the holder of the instrument. B, a non-holder in possession of the instrument who has the rights of a holder. Now let's consider the lawyer who drew that up. A non-holder in possession. I don't get it. I broke in through the window and stole the promissory note from you, so I have it in my possession. But I'm not really entitled to enforce it because I stole it. So a non-holder in possession of the instrument who has the rights of a holder. In other words, you have to be the person named as the person whose the debt would be owed to. Or C, a person not in possession of the instrument who is entitled to enforce the instrument pursuant to section 3309 or subdivision D of section 3418. A person may be a person entitled to enforce the instrument even though the person is not the owner of the instrument or is in wrongful possession of the instrument. Boy, there's a winner. I broke in through the window. I am in wrongful possession of the instrument because I stole it, but I may be entitled to enforce the instrument. Can, can, can you imagine a situation like that? I can. Let's say you have a check that's written to cash and somebody breaks in through the window and steals it. Hey, if it's written to cash, unless you can prove that I stole it, I have the right to cash it at any, at any bank. And the California Commercial Code is the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC. Uh, deed of Trust. Authenticity is not required as a condition precedent to admissibility with respect to a certified copy of a public record, such as the deed of trust. Now, they never record the promissory note, so you can't get a, you couldn't put the promissory note in without somebody testifying to it, otherwise it's hearsay evidence. The only public records that can be entered without anybody testifying to it would be, you know, a birth certificate, a marriage license, things that are recorded in the public record, like at the county recorder's office. So they could have gone down and got a certified copy of the deed of trust at the county recorder's office, but they didn't do that. The deed of trust in this case gives the appearance of being a certified copy of the original recorded deed. However, the purported certification is defective. It states only, quote, I hereby certify that this is a true and exact copy of the original, followed by the signature of Martha J. Urquilo. A certified copy of the public record must be made by the custodian or other person authorized to make the certification. If you go down to the county recorder's office, the county recorder will stamp a certified copy of your deed of trust, and they'll have a little uh, seal and whatnot that proves that they're the county recorder. Here the authenticity of the deed of trust is disputed by the debtor, presumably in consequence thereof, MERS has declined to move its admission into evidence. That's strange. And then he has the footnote, the declarant's total lack of competence to testify on the motion raises a serious question as to the good faith of counsel for MERS under Rule 9011. Counsel should have known that Turner was incompetent to testify as to anything relevant to this motion. Thus, counsel should not have filed with the court the declaration in which he stated falsely under penalty of perjury. I have personal knowledge of the matter set forth in this declaration, and if called upon to testify, as he was, I would and I could and would competently testify thereto. Other defects in the motion. You know, there is no evidence before the court as to who is the present holder in, entitled to enforce the note. The holder must join in the motion for relief stay. So they kicked it out, said they could file again. Okay, here's from an actual deed of trust. And it says, this is going to be on all deeds of trust, borrower covenants that borrower is lawfully seized of the estate hereby conveyed and has the right 
to grant and convey the property. So let's think about that for a minute again. Borrower covenants, that means you make an agreement that the borrower is lawfully seized of the estate. Okay, here's from Black's Law. Covenant, right? Covenant. Law of contracts, an agreement, convention, or promise of two or more parties. Wait a minute. Nobody, the bank didn't sign the deed of trust, so I guess it's not a covenant then, because it has to be a promise of two or more parties in by deed in writing signed sealed now the importance of the seal is very is very significant and delivered by which either of the parties pledges himself to the other that something is either done or shall be done or stipulates for the truth of certain facts so the borrower covenants that the borrower is lawfully seized of the a state hereby conveyed and has the right to grant and convey the property and that the property is unencumbered. That means there's no liens against it. Here we have, right out of Black's Law Dictionary, the definition of seize. To put in possession, invest with fee simple, be seized of or in, be legal possessor of or be holder in fee simple. Henley versus Stewart, 155, PA, Super, 535. Unencumbered, except for encumbrances of record. Well, when you signed this deed of trust, what was the encumbrances of record? There was nothing. Until you signed this, there was no lien against the property. So here you're stating they're asking you to sign that you own the property completely outright and that you're going to gift it to the bank. So we're going to do a, just a quick recap of the timeline for the foreclosure remedy. One, the dis we're going to dispute the debt by sending them a notary or third party proof of service and verification of response debt validation letter. Send a QWR with it. So you're going to get the debt validation letter and the QWR and you're going to have a third party friend, some disinterested party, not you or your girlfriend or your wife, but somebody else who could be trusted, who could be called to court as a witness to say that they sent the debt validation letter and the QWR off. You're going to send these to the principals, original lender, trustee, beneficiary, the current servicer as noted on the original deed of trust that you're going to get from the county recorder's office by certified mail with green signature return cards and you're going to send them to the CEO or CFO care of Bank of America or care of Countrywide or care of whoever the lender was I don't care if the lenders out of business at this point you're going to mail it off and then when you get it back saying that they no longer exist you have your proof Two get a certified copy of the deed of trust or mortgage at the county recorder's office get a copy of the loan application from your lender or loan servicer when you send the QWR and the debt validation letter we're gonna ask for the loan application this is important because you signed the loan application so your signature is binding you three send an opportunity to cure after ten days giving all parties a second chance to provide proof of claim and again, you're going to send the certified mail green return card to all the parties. Four, send a notice of default. Default. So in other words, one is a notice of default and the other is the default. Slash estoppel to all parties by notary or third party proof of service. Also with certified mail green return cards and you're going to attach a notice to cease and desist claiming any debt owed by John Doe or John Doe in all capital letters. The person who borrowed the money on the loan was John Doe in all capital letters. Your name in all capital letters. You won't find the debt being owed by your name in upper and lower case. So you want to make sure if you just say that you don't owe a debt anymore by John Doe in upper and lower case they don't care because it's John Doe in all uppercase that owes, owes the debt. The second part would be one. After getting the default, 
get the notary or the third party to sign a declaration of inadequate response or non-response to the debt validation letters and QWR. Technically they have 60 days to respond to the QWR, but they're still supposed to respond in 20 days that they received it. And usually they'll send you a response by showing you a statements of the money that you paid and, and they'll probably send you copies of the promissory note and the deed of trust showing, trying to establish that you made an agreement to pay money. But that's an inadequate response because it doesn't answer all the points in the debt validation letter or all the points in the QWR. Two, take the deed of trust or mortgage and the loan application and stamp each page with your cancellation stamp and sign and date each stamped area. Three, make four or five copies of the canceled certified copy that you got from the county recorder's office with the stamped cancellation on it and make, if you can, make uh, color copies and don't remove the staple as I said get a flatbed scanner and make a color copy and just um, pull the pages over one at a time and make copies of them and make them into originals by personally certifying they are true and correct copies with your wet ink signature certifying them you can do this because it's you are the one that's signing them now you can't make copies, you can't certify copies from that you can get from the county recorder's office. But these aren't copies you can get from the county recorder's office, are they? Once you've stamped them, they become different from the ones that are available at the county recorder's office. So you're making copies of your, you know, you're certifying that you modified these. Keep the original and send the certified copies to the principal parties, the lender, trustee, beneficiary, and the current servicer could also find out who had the title insurance and send a copy to the original title company. In fact, you're going to want to find out who had the original title insurance. Then one, you're going to go to the county recorder and file a notice of intent to preserve interest, citing your state's codes that authorize it. In California, it's um, there's a code that authorizes it, and I'm sure each state has their own version of that. So you're going to have to go down to the county recorder's office and ask them to help you to find the template that, that works for notice of intent to preserve interest. In it, you will state that you are claiming sole right to the title and interest in the property and describe the property as on the grant deed or on your closing documents with meets and bounds if possible. That's where I start at one pipe and I go 135 feet north, you know, so many degrees, and then I go east, you know, 120 feet. That's what meets and bounds are. You will make a d declaration notarized that you canceled the deed of trust on the recorder's number 205-349-82990 or whatever it is, you know, there is a recorder's number on the deed of trust. So you want to note that you canceled the deed of trust and defaulted the lender on proving their claim to title and interest in said property on such and such a date. Whatever date the notice of default went out, you're going to give them 21 days, but you know, you may not end up doing that for 30 days or 35 days or whatever. So you're going to note the certified mail number and the date that you, that you uh, defaulted them. And then you're going to have your declaration notarized and added as an attachment to your notice of intent to preserve interest. And then you're going to send a notice to cease and desist making any claims to rights or interest in the described property to the principal parties once again along with your certified copy from the recorder of your notice of intent to preserve interest. And the notice of intent to preserve interest is really a lien, like the deed of trust is a lien, to the principal parties, certified mail, green return cards by proof of service from a third party. And that should make your claim pretty airtight. If they try to have a trustee sale or they try to claim some kind of right to the property after you've noticed them and shown them that you've recorded these documents, 
they are trespassing on your title. You can charge them criminally. If they send you notices after that you've canceled the deed of trust and after you've defaulted them on proving their right to claim any interest in the property, then that is mail fraud. And you can so you could let it, write a letter to the um, postal inspector and accuse them of mail fraud. Okay. So the last thing we're going to do, the last thing we're going to do is one, go to the county recorder's office and file a notice of intent to preserve interest. This is a common law lien against property. Citing your state's codes that authorize it, ask the recorder to help you find the right template. In it, you will state that you are claiming sole right to the title and interest in the property, and describe the property as on the grant deed or on your closing documents, with meets and bounds if possible. Meets and bounds are that where, you know, you say that at the... Uh, at the northeast corner there's a pipe in the ground and you go 125 feet east and then 200 feet south and so you just march out the uh, the distance in feet and the angle that you're marching you will make a declaration notarized that you canceled the deed of trust and identify it recorder's number 2005 three four nine eight two nine nine zero or whatever it is on such and such date and defaulted the lender on proving their claim to title and interest in said property on the date that you defaulted them march tenth twenty eleven or whatever date it was and use the <coughs> certified mail number that you sent to identify it and have your declaration notarized and added as an attachment to your notice to of intent to preserve interest you could file all of the um, canceled documents online in Texas at National Republic Registry and they'll give you a, a file number where you can see it and you could make notice of that in your declaration also. Send a notice to cease and desist making any claims to rights or interest in the described property to the principal parties along with your certified copy from the recorder of your notice of intent to preserve interest, which is really a lien like the deed of trust, to the principal parties, certified mail, green recurring cards, by proof of service from a third party or your notary.